Good afternoon from Austin, Texas, where autumn means we can finally open the windows and enjoy the fall that you all have been experiencing up in the northern climates. Um, on behalf of the NMC, I'm delighted to welcome you to NMC Beyond the Horizon Digital Badges in Higher Education. For this uh, edition of the NMC Beyond the Horizon, we will have a focused conversation on a new digital trend that is disrupting traditional education, digital badges. Um, you're in for a treat today. Uh, this is uh, inspired from a, a NMC summer conference uh, session that was very well attended um, in Washington, D.C. this uh, a few months ago. So uh, we thought it would be a good idea to, to bring this out to the community and give you an opportunity to learn about some of these cool projects uh, that Jonathan's going to uh, talk about today. Uh, I'm your host, Alex Freeman. I am the Director of Membership and Special Projects at the NMC. I'm joined by uh, the NMC's Gordon Jackson, who is here to assist with technical support. Our, our hashtag for the, today's event is hashtag NMCHZ, as Victoria on our staff uh, calls NMC Cheese or NM Cheese. So NMCHZ is uh, the hashtag we use for all things Horizon Report related. Uh, now on to the moderator of today's program, Jonathan Finkelstein. Uh, Jonathan is the founder and CEO of Credly, creator of the Open Credit Digital Credential Framework and director of the Open Source Badge OS project. Together these platforms have enabled thousands of organizations to recognize and reward skills and achievement. Uh, I'd like to take, it, take this opportunity to, to Give it over to Jonathan. Jonathan. Hey, thanks, Alex, and thanks to the NMC team and uh, Gordon Jackson, who's on as well, and uh, for for inviting us to take the show on the road, so to speak. Uh, Diane Singer and I had a great time at the NMC Summer Conference, uh, interacting with uh, so many uh, members of the community on this topic, and we're glad to have another opportunity, and this time to extend uh, the discussion to not only include all of you, but also to include our friend and colleague Susan Manning, who has actually graciously volunteered to act as the facilitator and keep uh, us on track and, and ensure that we get uh, everybody involved in the conversation today. So before I say anything further, I'm going to turn it to Susan Manning to say hello and set the stage a little. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, for a second, I was thinking I'm not used to seeing you just stand up and, and deliver without slides. Do we have any? Oops. Can you yes. push that out? I can. It, okay, thanks. Here they come. My role today will be to introduce, uh, well, I'll introduce myself, and then I'll talk a little bit about Jonathan, or turn it back to him and to Diane each. Um, we had originally titled this using digital badges in competency-based and other higher ed programs, but really the way we think about it is taking competencies and achievements and turning them into marketing marketable credentials. And so that's kind of going to be our focus today when we talk about what employers are looking for, what are competencies that individuals moving through the higher ed system might be developing, and how they can use badges to, in fact, um, denote and then market those credentials. So as Jonathan told you, I am Susan Manning from the University of Wisconsin at Stout. Uh, I teach instructional design, but I also work with badge system designs with Credly. And um, so I've been kind of all over the map in terms of helping organizations look at what those competencies might be for students and how they would recognize those. And that's how I got to meet Diane at Brandman. And so I'm going to actually have her introduce herself next. Thank you, Susan, very much. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Diane, and in my role at Brandman, um, I'm the project manager responsible for the content on Project Manage, the, the Credly application, um, and I'm also adjunct faculty. Thank you. Great. Then let's hear from Jonathan. Um, and Jonathan, I'll let you introduce yourself and then move forward with uh, kind of explaining the picture of what employers are looking for and how we've been focused on that. Sure. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so my day-to-day -day, uh, focus and is 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 really around uh, introducing uh, ways for people to get credit for their skills and competencies and achievement, and for those to have meaning, which often means that they're coming out of uh, systems and assessment processes that have the stamp of approval of organizations like Brandman, um, and uh, and that they have a way of moving out into the world where they are consumed or absorbed 
uh, by uh, other organizations who would who would value them, who would give people a raise, a promotion, give them a job. Um, and so, um, Susan, it sounds like it might make sense for me to maybe just walk through a little bit and get us all on the same page about what we're thinking about when we talk about uh, digital credentials first, and then maybe connect that with with the, the marketability part that that Susan mentioned. So I I'll agree. do it. Okay, Go perfect. So I'll do a short uh, a short walk through, but uh, I encourage um, uh, Alex uh, to let us know if he sees any uh, questions that pop up, and and Susan and Diane will be keeping their eyes out as well. So I'll keep this uh, brief. Um, the 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 uh, I'm sure if I asked all of you to think about what you know that you can do, the things you know about yourself, your own skills, your own uh, talents, uh, I'm sure that most of you would probably indicate that you know far more than the world actually gives you credit for. And that credit, the kind of credit we're used to, is typically credit that would show up on a college transcript. And yet most of us know that the typical college transcript is fairly opaque, uh, usually not current for very long, doesn't have a level of specificity that uh, really describes, in most cases, the kind of skills that you have. And it's not ultimately in your controls. You have to request it and send it around and um, it's generally not used very often for most people after their first job. Um, the way we'd like to think about digital badges and the role they play is a little bit like taking a Sharpie marker to your academic transcript um, in part. I don't know about you but if I had a chance I would have liked to have done this to my college transcript. Um, I would have liked to have had the power to selectively choose the, the things that, uh, that I valued and that I thought were my strengths. Um, the same is true when you get to the workplace too. We don't, most of the skills that you develop in the work environment are not recorded in anywhere in any kind of verified way. Yes, we have our resumes and we have our public profiles, but those tend to be self-reported. They're not consistent. Uh, they're generally not certifications. Um, and so they're not portable and they're also not, not in our control as we move uh, between workplaces and companies. So when we think about uh, alternative credentials and the kinds of things we'll be talking about today, often represented by digital badges or certifications, we're talking about the kind of credential that, that a quarter of adults now have that have doubled in the last 10 years and expected to double again in the next five years in terms of their availability. And we know that they matter. People who have some kind of official certification uh, not only get more views in job sites and profiles like LinkedIn, but they also um, uh, uh, have higher salaries and, and, uh, and better mobility uh, and, and progressions within the workplace. Um, and as we're going to turn to hear from Diane in a few minutes um, with one specific example around competency-based ed, but that movement towards competency-based ed and what we're looking at. So at least... Um, uh, 400 institutions now and, and uh, almost uh, as many as nearly 800 are expected in the next few years to have programs that get to the level of competency and, and, and verification at a skill at a more granular level. And uh, so that kind of leads us, all of those trends, all of those movements around alternative credentials, giving people more control over their specific skills and competencies, kind of leads us to the conversation today. Um, and uh, Susan, before I turn it back to you to, to keep the uh, conversation uh, moving and to explore some some other directions, let me just say a word or two more about what we think about when we think about digital credentials. We, we think of them as, as having a life cycle, a life cycle that needs to start with someone like Brandman, like the uh, like uh, University of Wisconsin Stout, um, defining or uh, describing what the criteria is, what the credential is, and then distributing it to the people who've met that criteria. The people who earn it need to have a way of managing it, receiving it, and using it, putting it to good use, which can include both pushing or pull, having it pulled into their company's intranet or talent management system or pushing it out to a public profile like LinkedIn or whatnot. Um, and then there needs to be a, a loop or a feedback cycle so that everyone involved in this process can track and analyze and better understand uh, where, uh, uh, where and how these credentials are being used so that you can help stack or cascade or, or create uh, the ability for people to identify gaps uh, and then in their skills and, um, and, and, and also look across their, the different contexts in which they work and bring those skills together uh, uh, in a way that um, can help them be recognized uh, for new opportunities. So there's a lot of groups issuing credentials. You've probably heard of many. In fact, some of your institutions may be among those who are involved. Um, and uh, we're going to look at a few examples today. Um, 
I'm going to take uh, maybe 90 seconds to two minutes more, Susan. Is that okay uh, at, at the intro before we go, come back to you? Go right ahead. We're not going to stop you. Okay. Well, you should if you <laughs> feel like it's time for another voice. But uh, just laying the groundwork for our discussion a little bit more. Um, when you think about what's, the, what's in it for different uh, groups, um, and I see the question that came in uh, that was passed on here, when it comes to employers looking at badges to indicate competency, is there any information backing how relevant the employers see digital credentials? And that's that's a very important part of this question. Is you know where does the uh, where did the um, uh, w w w what are the different ways in which credentials uh, have value ascribed to them? And we'll talk a little bit about that in the next moment or two, but but at length during this discussion. Um, so it helps certainly a group look across all of the different points of input and places where they do assessment and unify the way they recognize recognition, whether it's through a learning management system or through a face-to-face -face, uh, workshop environment where people's attendance is being you know, considered and their participation is part of, a, a part of their uh, uh, progression, or even with a customer relationship management system like Salesforce where you might be collecting information about people who have completed your programs. All of these are places where data is stored and that data can add up to or stack to something that might add up to being a credential. We talked a little bit about being able to track your alumni and your current program participants uh, and digital credentials are allowing organizations to do that even beyond their own borders, starting, starting to get to know the people they interact with through the skills they're earning with other groups too. And then by consistently reporting that data out into public profiles and even into private intranet systems where companies look across their talent pool and figure out who should be on new product and project teams. Um, uh, because that data is being reported in a consistent way, it's easier for people to, to find and identify uh, those folks. And there's a big marketing opportunity for everyone who's leading programs today to help differentiate themselves from other places where people might learn and be certified. Because one of the best ways to let the world know about the great work your programs are providing at your institutions is by the people who've completed them, people who are out in the workforce uh, using the skills and demonstrating their competencies in real world settings. So there's a, a big marketing piece to all this um, from, from everyone's perspective that we, we shouldn't neglect. And although I have for a period of time was leaving this out of my conversations because I didn't want people to think that digital badges and credentials were a uh, an aspect of you know a game that this was some kind of you know game strategy or gamification approach. Um, I think it's important to realize that if any of you have ever been called up on stage to receive an award or a diploma or a degree or even have had a certificate handed to you by somebody, especially when you know you earned it and it's a and you are worthy of the recognition, it feels really good, and um, and there's no reason that people shouldn't have a, a delightful experience when uh, an organization they trust and value is returning the favor or the, uh, is, is acknowledging the, the, the work you put in and giving you official credit for that. So it is a way of keeping people close and connected uh, to you, your programs, your institution. And finally, there's a great value to earners too. Uh, of course, they can permanently store their achievements when they're stored as digital badges from across many different organizations, departments, and programs. As we mentioned earlier, they can selectively use them in both human-readable ways, meaning ways you can see on a LinkedIn profile, but also in machine-readable ways. In other words, where the data behind those credentials can be read even when that person is not present in order to surface and find uh, people for opportunities. And finally, going along with that conversation a moment ago about marketing, it, as I said, it goes both ways. And learners are often proud to showcase what are really endorsements from institutions that they've been accepted to, uh, into which they've uh, been involved with, with programs and learning and assessments. Uh, they trust the organization to uh, have developed programs that will prepare them for the workforce, uh, and they're proud to, in turn, showcase those, those credentials. So, Susan, I'm going to leave it there. Good. I want to jump right into Diane's portion and addressing Stephanie's question about, um, let's just find the question and read it. When it comes to employers looking at badges to indicate competency, is there any information backing how relevant the employers see the digital credentials? And <laughs> Diane would be ideally situated to talk about that because when Brandman University started developing the first competency-based degree fully, fully online, um, 
the Bachelors of Business Administration, they began by going out to employers and asking what kinds of skills and competencies do you need in a graduate? What do you expect them to be able to do? And they built their program based on that. I'm going to try to do my best to represent Diane. Uh, so from that, they called 80 or so competencies. Now, I had asked the question earlier how many of you were familiar with competency-based education, whether this is with the big competency-based or in smaller sets, essentially you are trading seat time for learning experiences that would develop those competencies for the individual. So um, there is always an assessment that comes in the beginning to find out where that student is in terms of what they might already know, and then they start issuing content based on that assessment. So you're not having to go back and learn things you already know or spend time on that content if it's something that you can already prove. Instead, you are selectively served the content that you need as a learner and as you prove that you've got that competency and that could be either by direct testing, it could be project work, um, faculty are involved in reviewing and shaping uh, the work of the, the students, then those competencies are checked off. And that's how someone eventually acquires a degree. Now, one of the things that's very exciting with Diane's next project, it's a bachelor's, and I'm not going to be able to say this, I know it's IT in the end, so it's, it's based on the entire IT industry. I don't know if it's a Bachelor of Arts or Bachelor of Science. Um, they are working, they're developing that right now, and that should be coming online within the next year and a half, I believe. What's additionally exciting about that is that those competencies are going to, to also parallel or be paralleled by industry standard competencies, you know, like Cisco certification, for instance. Uh, so as the student works through this new degree, they will be acquiring competencies which will be recognized as digital badges, but they will also be earning certifications that will go to feed directly into the industry. I'm going to kind of stop there. Jonathan, what have I not said about that program? Uh, that, that was that was terrific, and um, I just bringing up Diane's uh, slide uh, on this uh, right now, so we can just take a, a look at a, a quick snapshot. But I think uh, the, the the concept that credentials earned or or skills recognized within the college setting in an online competency based program are going to be combined with industry recognized certifications. In other words. This is a great example of this 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 stacking that a lot of people are talking about, but uh, where you know the examples are just beginning to emerge. This idea that everyone has a role to play. The industry certifications are uh, are widely known and recognized in certain settings and certain certifications. Not all of them are. There's a there's there's a plethora of uh, of certifications that 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 uh, that that uh, may not be known in certain fields too. But when you combine what Brandman is doing in assessing each learner with these industry certifications. I think you start to be able to, you know, deliver on on that promise of everyone ever, you know, of it taking a village, if you will, to to uh, recognize people for 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 all of their skills. Uh, and uh, and that's where the digital badges are particularly unique because they can represent um, achievements. They're very portable, transferable, secure, and increasingly open standards way of allowing this kind of information to flow between settings. And I think one of the things, too, to point out about the, the um, well, both the badges and competency-based education is that a student can show an employer that they are making progress by having that digital badge and showing the competencies that they're racking up as they're working through. And there's something to be said, not in a gamified way, but in marking progress toward completion, while also marketing your your skills that you're developing, whether they're hard skills or soft skills. If we asked our audience for the various soft skills that they've developed that are not recognized at this point, you can see the value that, um, that those skills carry. And often 
that's what gets somebody the job. It's the soft skills. Or that's what allows you to keep your job, maybe. <laughs> Actually, maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the soft skills use cases within uh, higher ed that you're seeing um, and that we're seeing across the, the landscape. Um, the uh, uh, one program, uh, it comes out of our friends at the uh, University of Notre Dame who have created essentially a a co- or extracurricular transcript that complements what the learners are um, doing in the classroom with an official record of the skills that they might pick up in places like, um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, doing AV activities on campus or fulfilling health requirements towards, a, you know, uh, applying to medical school. Things that aren't on their transcript, but they might be doing research. They might be working in a lab and so forth. Uh, they might have done study abroad programs or have demonstrated leadership by being you know, part of a club or an activity. So they are, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and, and, and bring up a little snapshot of what this looks like at the University of Notre Dame. Um, so here, for example, you'll, you're looking at badges that they issue for service learning activities. Uh, students, uh, it says, can earn this badge by demonstrating with creativity, critical thinking, and thoughtfulness what they've learned uh, through their experience uh, in a service lear learning set of activities called the Appalachia Seminar that they do. And then they even go a step further in actually saying that 10% of students who, who uh, showcase their service learning work in an e-portfolio um, are uh, considered uh, uh, the, uh, they, they kind of create a series of awards where the badgers are recognizing the people who are producing the most evidence uh, of these kinds of skills. So if we, we look in, here's another example. Um, this is uh, the remix or media skills that they've, that they've done, and you can see they do badges for image editing, sound editing, video editing. These are not things that are necessarily part of any one course, uh, but they are available through programs that are led by the libraries uh, and the Office of uh, Information Technology. Now what's really interesting about the uh, Notre Dame program as well is they use a, an e-portfolio system on campus. They're using a tool called Education. And uh, the way it works is they've got an integration between the portfolio and the digital credential or digital badging system. Uh, oops, I went one, one, one too far. That's, that's your next one coming up in the second <laughs> season. Um, and, uh, and so it's, a, it's sort of a, a, a complete cycle. The, uh, Accumulating of appropriate evidence in your portfolio can lead to earning a digital badge upon its being reviewed, and then the digital badge can appear on the portfolio so that uh, somebody reviewing that portfolio of evidence uh, benefits from the fact that someone uh, in a le leadership or a faculty uh, or service learning position at Notre Dame has done the hard work of getting to know the student, their work, reviewing it, and putting their seal of approval on it. So they've connected it in both directions, and it's, a, it's an interesting project. Uh, other questions here? I think I see another one. Yeah, Stephanie is having a, a little chat conversation with me about the fact that they have programs set up where um, they're teaching people um, 3D printing, 3D scanning, some highly technical skills. And um, the students go through those workshops. They're interested in learning the information, but very few seem to value the digital credential. And to that, Stephanie, I would ask what industries around you or other stakeholders might help promote the value of that badge. And I also see that Diane is back, and I'm going to kind of throw her into the mix. Diane, I tried my best to represent what's going on at Brandman, especially with your new degree and the industry certifications. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Sure, Susan, you do employer, IT employers, and we ask them, you know, what are you looking for in the way of graduates? What, what kind of skill sets do you want? Um, and, but more importantly, uh, what, do you, what do you want them to know how to do? And that was the really important part, the do part. And one of the, the feedback that we got across the board was that employers prospective candidates to become certified in whatever uh, IT area, A+, cloud computing, um, you know, network project management there's a million different so we developed our BSIT program it's competency based um, it's really important to note that we don't teach to the exam we give we prepare the students academically um, but we give them projects to do as part of their academic learning that support the certification process so they're learning the skills they need 
to demonstrate in the certification process. As a result, um, when students graduate, they'll get their BSIT plus they'll have whatever certifications that they um, have mastered in the process. So it's really that um, that students are graduating with with not only a degree but also certification. And employers want that. Was it difficult to get the employers to give that information? What was what was the way that you went about that? Oh, not at all. You know, we just approached them. We just went up to we went to major employers that are in Irvine. You know, we're based in Irvine, California, so we have quite a a technical community across the street from us is Blizzard Entertainment, and I don't know if your kids are into gaming, but I know my son, he saw we were at Blizzard across the street, and he was really excited. So that's a huge IT group, you know, and there are a lot of companies like that, high-tech companies in, in Southern California. Um, we also did a lot of traveling, and we went on the road, and we talked to big employers. We talked to Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, um, Apple T graduates, and, and uh, across the board, certification was huge. I had to click on the link um, for the question about how would we answer to criticism as described in the Wall Street Journal article, and the article is, uh, online skills are hot, but will they land you a job? And well, I don't, I have not read this, so I don't know, it's just today's issue today, so I haven't read it, I don't know if either of you have. Okay, so will 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 the skill sets land you a job? Well, you know, number one, the job market's kind of tough. But if we give employers what they want, which are students who who have mastered employers want. Remember, it's really all about what you know and what you know how to do. And the emphasis on the do part, SIT in particular, um, will present employers with candidates that actually know how to do something. You know, as, as you go through the BSIT program, as you as you master certain skill sets, you're going to be awarded a badge, and that badge is going to contain metadata that that shares with the prospective employer what the student did to demonstrate this mastery. So maybe it's a project, maybe it's a paper, it's some research, it's something tangible, it's evidence to the employer that this student um, actually knows how to do the thing it is they says he needs to do, and I think that employer. You, know, you go through this whole recruitment cycle, you interview people, you sit there, you look at references, these are references they provided you, they don't know whether the employer, their employee they're hiring can do what it is they say to do until they get on the job. We believe that it contains the evidence. Employers have that much more assurance that the, the person they're hiring actually knows how to do what it is they say they can do. Neil's comment here about in the case of Bremen, it's not a one-to-one -one badge competency system. There'll be five to nine uh, badges cluster for most badges. Yeah, that's um, that's actually me, Diane, answering Neil's question. He was answered. He was asking, "How granular are the badges? Is it one badge per competency?" And so no, no, they're that. clustered together. That's that's right, Susan. They're clustered together because, you know, um, the sum of your knowledge is you took it. Your mastery is really connected to the mastery of something else. So that's why. Diane, your audio had just cut out for me. Um, I'm going to ask Jonathan to continue answering that question, though, that we started with before uh, about the Wall Street Journal article. That's great. Thank you. And so I'm so sorry that this is happening. I'm having all these technical issues today. <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that's okay, Diane. We're, 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 getting, uh, we're, we're certainly getting the, the heart of what, uh, of what you're saying, and that's, that's key. I think one, one important... Um, uh, point made in 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 this article or, or two in particular. One, of course, is a uh, a mention of the Credential Transparency Initiative work being funded by Lumina uh, to make some steps towards allowing uh, giving organizations that are in a position to issue credentials have the opportunity to describe them in a common way, so that uh, we can begin to make some sense in the marketplace about what the uh, connections are and relationships between the different kinds of certifications available. So I think that's a, a step in the right direction. I know we're uh, playing a role in that uh, in that program, uh, being part of the uh, uh, a few of the, the committees where that work is 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 uh, unfolding. So we're excited to see where that leads. But uh, the uh, the article also made a, a mention that one of the most important skills uh, is the ability uh, for employee employees uh, of today and of the future uh, is to is to show your uh, how you learn? What kind of a learner are you? I know when I'm interviewing people for jobs, as I'm 
doing right now as, as we continue to grow is one of the things I look for most is evidence that someone's a good learner. You can hire someone today, but uh, six months, a year, 18 months, two years from now, have you, um, have they, are they still the same person you were when you hired them, or have they continued to learn? Of course, they're the same person, but are their skills the same? Have their skills continued to advance? I am less concerned about the skills somebody has today um, and more concerned with how they attained them. In other words, did they seek out their own professional development? Did they take courses online? Did they find available opportunities? And to some extent, it matters where those learning experiences happened and whose stamp of approval is on uh, and is assessing them. But I want to know that they're curious, that they're engaged, that they know how to learn themselves, that they can uh, be self-starters. And I think the article also includes um, the perspective that uh, digital credentials and badges and one-off courses um, are help, a helpful way of proving that somebody is an active, ongoing learner, and it gives a verified sense of the kinds of things they pursue when they're given, uh, when they're left uh, to, to their own uh, devices, if you will. So, in any event, I thought that was a particularly important point of the article. Melanie said she's in. Dell country and they're seeking folks with industry certification and not badges. Well, the, the, the badge doesn't supplant the certification. The certification has to be there first. The badge is just another way to represent that, as I understand it with Diane's work. I think that's such an important distinction, Susan, that uh, I think that's absolutely right, uh, too, in terms of the, 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 the point that Melanie made. I mean, people, people aren't in search of badges any more than they're in search of a piece of paper. Right? You don't say, I need a piece of paper to prove that I uh, went to college. You say, I need a degree or I need a transcript. Right? A badge is those things. It's, it's what's printed on it that matters. And so you've probably seen many digital badges on somebody's LinkedIn profile, whether you've known it or not. They show up as data, just as where they graduated and which industry certifications they took. So what we're simply talking about with digital badges in this realm is uh, making uh, open, democratizing to some extent and opening the doors to new and alternative kinds of credentials that haven't t typically been on, you know, in-framed, uh, you know, embossed, sealed, uh, degree-looking things. What about smaller or alternative versions of those? Who else and in what other settings can you have your skills verified? Um, they don't all have to take two or four years. Sometimes they might take, you know, two weeks, two months, uh, or or or. Uh, give or take to be able to prove a certain set of skills. So um, I agree, employers are not looking for badges uh, and they're even not looking for certifications. They're looking for verified skills to save them the time in narrowing the pool of candidates, of finding people and looking for signals um, that they've got people that are matched to the jobs they have. You had al also um, passed an article on to me this morning, Jonathan, from the Chronicle of Higher Education about credentials. Um, the title is Cranking Out Credentials, but what about quality? You had a great metaphor for that um, in terms of the smaller credentials that people might want to earn in the future and what that says about their ongoing education. You want to bring up the house metaphor? Yeah, sure. And you know what? Uh, I don't know if I, I think this is a, a fair game for me to for me to do. I know this article, um, I believe, is uh, behind the Chronicles paywall, but I'm going to put the link in to the chat for good measure anyway and share it on my screen so everyone who is not a Chronicle subscriber can see it for a moment here as well. Um, so um, it cites the um, uh, Utah College of Applied Technology uh, and how they are accounting for. Uh, uh, co completion rates and degrees and starting and, and how they're and including the number of certificates issued uh, as, as part of their uh, completion and graduation rates. But, but um, I think the part of the article that you're referring to, Susan, appears near the end, if I recall, uh, in, uh, in which this focus on completion rates is being described. And you have a gentleman uh, from the Institute for Higher Education Policy who said that when international organizations judge completion rates, they count only basic degrees. While shorter term credentials are recognized in the US, badges and similar credentials, he says, shouldn't be. He says to do so would be like, quote, saying people who pour cement for a building foundation have completed, even though the building site is still just a hole in the ground with the beginnings of a foundation. 
So that's an interesting metaphor, but I, I think if we're going to use this metaphor, we should probably also say to ourselves, well, let's assume the building's done. How many of you would move into a house that was just completed and not do any kind of maintenance or work on it for the next 80 years? I think within two years, it would probably be starting to crumble, whether it's from hurricanes or storms or lack of waterproofing or paint or fixing the plumbing or the cracks. You, I don't think there's any such thing as a completed education. Um, it's something that you continue to build on. In fact, in the IT field, a field in which we see a lot of digital badges and credentials, whether it's through boot camps or after school programs or IT departments at, at colleges and universities, including uh, Harvard, which has a digital badge program for its own IT people, we're talking about um, ongoing skills in which my own developers tell me that if they don't learn that it, within two years, if they don't continue learning every single day, the skills for which I hired them are going to be obsolete. Um, so I, I think the metaphor is a good one, but it should be taken to its logical conclusion, which is education never ends and needs constant and ongoing certification and reskilling. Okay, I'm uh, again responding to a comment that Matthew just made. Um, would you describe badges as curated, standardized web presence? focused on career development? And I would say yes, in this context I would, totally. Um, I'm also thinking of some other people who are working in the area of assessing soft skills. Not necessarily the hard IT kinds of things, but um, Jonathan help me out because I can't remember the name of the company, but the people who, uh, we've, we've been in discussion with a couple organizations that actually assess students in career competencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, a, whole, a whole range of, of, of organizations doing really interesting work, as many of you probably know, uh, groups ranging from match point careers to ETS and ACT, um, and, and so many others doing taking a different angle on trying to save employers the hard work of uh, figuring out whether someone is both a good fit, whether they have the non-cognitive skills that will, that will help them be successful. One, one uh, example of a group, and I, I want to turn to Diane and get her um, take on how Brandman addresses and, and to the extent to which those kinds of skills are part of the what is assessed in their programs. Um, one quick example, and I'll, I'll go to my web browser again and, and, uh, and share this link. Um, so uh, Deakin Digital is an offshoot of Deakin University in Australia. And I'm going to bring up their website right now, deepindigital.com, but you can see me sharing it. They've got um, an interesting model which says a great deal of what someone who would have a master's degree in IT would have are um, skills in and verified skills in collaboration, in communication. Um, digital literacy, the ability to innovate and problem solve, uh, an understanding of what professional ethics are all about. And what they've done is said, you know what, it doesn't matter whether you have a bachelor's degree. If you find yourself in a job and you're unable to advance because you don't have an advanced degree or any degree, um, they're going to allow you to come to Deacon Digital, take an assessment. Some of them are video-based where you're being interviewed. Others, you're producing work product. Uh, you pay a nominal, uh, a modest fee for the assessment. And when you've earned 16 of these assessments, you can transfer your digital badges to Deakin University itself, which after um, asking you to, to do a capstone project, will issue you uh, and confer upon you a master's degree. Um, and these are a number of the skills that are part of their program as you scroll through it and you view, view the credentials. These are, in many cases, non-cognitive skills um, that are, ha were always the hallmark of what being a master of something meant, and yet um, and yet really require you to have had some work experience before you could prove them. And yet today, most people who go on to master's degrees do so right out of their bachelor's with very little or any work experience. So this tries to get back to what a master's degree was all about and what being a well-rounded professional is all about. So Diane, I'm curious um, if I can put you on the spot. I know that your program uh, includes skills that, are, um, that, are, uh, that talk to these kinds of um, uh, needs within the workplace. How, how did you... Uh, arrive at what they are, and can you give us some examples of what some of those skills look like? Sure, we we call them power skills, not necessarily soft skills, because they're power skills. They're the they're the skills that that um, uh, uh, 
qualified people use to, to navigate the workplace to get things done. Conversation started, you know, years ago when we were all bandering about this whole standardized testing thing at the at the high school and, and, and level, and and what do employers really want their employees to be able to do when they get on the job? And power skills were, were a huge piece of what employers told us they wanted. So remembering that and going back and talking to these employers about our BSIT program and the kind of IT skills they want, the ability to, to craft a, 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 a a cogent email message and being able to to rally people in a meeting and to be able to make a presentation um, the skill um, that, that speaks to teamwork and and um, really partnering with each other those collaborative skills are very important to employers because at the end of the day you have to have not only the practical knowledge um, the technical knowledge to, to get the job done, but you also have to know how to organization, organizationally make it happen. And it's those power skills that allow a worker to make things happen. And that's really what we focused on. Hey, thanks, Diane. S Susan, you, I know you've been working on a program with uh, Illinois State that looks at, um, not dissimilar to, to, to Notre Dame in that they're looking across and outside the classroom in some, in some cases, but, um, but they are focused on a particular population within the school that, um, uh, and, and trying to uh, draw distinctions about the kind of work they're doing. Maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the work at Illinois State University. Yeah, and um, if you find, I don't know if you have an image of them or not, but um, this is Illinois State University's honors program is has developed a, a badge system that really starts from when the student matriculates as a freshman and those badges, those early badges, simply set the stage for who they are and their belongingness in the program. The student then enters at some point during their stay, they complete a seminar. Um, that seminar is offers several different badges for explicit academic skills that they're developing and a mindset, if you will. In fact, I think it's called the Mindset Seminar. As the student goes through their four or five years at Illinois State, they will be able to acquire additional badges that have more to do with um, study abroad or leadership positions. There are um, so there's a, it's a long range program, but what they're trying, what the administration there is trying to do is teach students not only to acquire those badges but then how to really leverage that experience to curate their badges and tell the story of who they are to a potential employer or graduate school if that's where they want to go on to next. So it is a it's an investment in that student because there's quite a bit that goes into teaching a student what to show, what to not show, how that badge as I said tells the story of that student's development. And they're not for, um, it's not just for an academic skill of finishing this class, they're for experiences that speak to the student's investment in learning. Jonathan, Eric had asked a question about putting badges on resumes. And I asked paper or online, and he said both, to be honest. But can you talk a little about the image of a badge and how, how you would use that? Um, you mentioned right in the beginning the idea of LinkedIn that you could put your badge on LinkedIn and and uh, yeah. walk us through that and then whether a badge would go on a paper resume. So you know the the badge which we'll refer to in this context as the image right it's the um, it's the picture at least in, as I understand uh, Eric's question I think the image I, serves two functions at the very least um, one is a, a, a process that I'll come back to in a second. The other is, you know, an immediate identification of, of, of a program or, or a credential. If you think right now, in your own world, which badges or emblems or seals, uh, they could be seals of, uh, you know, that an organization has earned, it could be a seal or something that you would wear on a uniform, what emblems do you actually recognize um, in your own community, in your own workplace? And I kind of turn this to all of you, like, if you saw something from a distance, couldn't read what was on it, um, how many of those things in your own life do you recognize? Go ahead and like name a few, put them in the chat. Like I can think of 
here's one for me. I, I could recognize somebody who is PADI certified, P-A-D-I, right, as a scuba diver. I know what the PADI emblem looks like. How many of you would recognize the police emblem or seal for the police officer in your community? Um, so there's a few, but when you think about the, the broad range of the number of certifications that are out there in the world, it's not uh, reasonable to expect that we would recognize every single logo or badge uh, except for maybe a, a finite number in any given, for any given person or context. For that reason, I think it's important not to put too much attention on the badge itself. Um, on LinkedIn, when you look at my badges that are there, uh, and you'll actually see I have a badge including from the NMC on my, on my, uh, uh, on my profile. Notice, though, that it's not the badge. It's the emblem. It's NMC. I think all of us would recognize the NMC logo even before we would recognize any of the sub-badges in most cases. Uh, I have a badge from the University of Wisconsin for being a presenter at their conference and from Educause uh, for uh, receiving a thought leader distinction, and it's their logos. So on LinkedIn, LinkedIn has made the decision uh, to, uh, to use logos uh, in this role and link people back to the organization. And, and with the, all of the badges you see on my uh, on my certification section actually came through through Credly and so we link up with the organization and present the data you can see what it is and so forth but when you click on it in the case of something like uh, this one from the University of Wisconsin it takes me out where you can see a greater set of uh, information and data about this achievement you can see evidence you can learn about the organization that issued it um, uh, a, Here's one from LearnLaunch, which is a group based in Boston, which uh, uh, helps uh, ed tech uh, organizations get started and, uh, and, and does a lot of work in, in ed tech. Theirs automatically redirects the earner, the, the, the observer, to their own web page where you see all of the data showing up on the site and yet can still see you know, information about the other programs they offer. So the, and then real quickly, I would just add that um, I've been finding that the process of creating a badge image, which I used to downplay and say wait till the end with it, for an organization that's creating a program, we have found a, we have this workshop we do with organizations to help them come up with a visual badge design. And what we've learned is that the process of doing that exercise brings a lot of people to the table uh, and thinks uh, in a holistic way about the badge system that they're trying to build um, and uh, has been a really useful activity. Like, how extensible does the system need to be? What's the role of the of the organization's brand on it? Um, uh, how many different topic areas are going to need to be covered? So, bottom line, I think the badge image uh, is a useful is useful for a lot of reasons, but not the reasons most people expect. And actually, that ties back to um, the earlier discussion we were having about getting stakeholders involved, uh, whether it's employers or people who are going to value the badge. Ultimately, um, I there was a great question a while back: Is the MOOC movement hurting the badge movement? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's funny. I don't know why it's so funny to me. Um, I what do you, what's your? I, I, it's a good question. I'm not laughing at the question um, directly. Uh, well, I don't th I don't think so. But I think this preceded our discussion about the quality issue of the badges. Um, there, some badges are very, very granular, and an earner might not want to be displaying those publicly. It's up to the earner to decide. Um, you, you could have badges in other areas of your life. You know, I got my Fitbit badges, but not everybody needs to know how many steps I walked yesterday. Um, and so with the MOOC, I've completed a couple of MOOCs that I've gotten badges for, but they're not really pub. They're not. They're not things that I show publicly. I don't think that diminishes the badges that um, we're talking about with certifications, for instance, or with competency-based education. That's my my opinion. And, and, and your point about the steps you took, I have a gazillion Zappos badges for shoes I purchased, <laughs> and that's got really nothing to do with anything except that it's a badge. Um, but I think it really depends on what the badge means to you, the person that holds the badge, and the, the kind of data that it has um, within it, and, uh, if, it's a, if it's career related. Um, maybe I want to use a badge to get a bigger discount on shoes, but you know, it depends on how you want to use the badge, and I think that's really up to the badge holder. Um, to your point, you know, the one who holds the evidence can decide how they want to use that badge, and, 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 and in many cases, I think 
what we're talking about here, at least as it relates to education space, it's about mastery professionally, Susan? Yeah, I, I didn't hear the, the end of what you said, but what I was going to add to that is the assessment question. When I've done MOOCs, um, there has not been a rich assessment of what I can do as a result of it, which might be why I don't show those badges publicly, but the badges that your students are earning, there's an assessment piece to it, and I think that assessment adds a, a value and a weightiness to those badges. Uh, the Mozilla question, I'm going to toss right over to Jonathan. Okay, let me read this question aloud here. Uh, Neil writes, with Mozilla pulling back from open badges and the Badge Alliance doing less and less, I was wondering what the panel thinks about the future of open badges. Um, it's interesting, open badges. Uh, open badges has been part of like an open community of lots of different groups and constituents who've been trying to think about what the world looks like when we all agree on a, a common approach for moving results-oriented information in the form of a credential or a badge from place to place. And so I, I think in a lot of ways the Open Badge movement has succeeded in what its grand vision was, was to get lots of different groups and players uh, into the room together thinking about how they can work uh, together. Um, the good news is that there's lots of groups working on all of this. Um, I think when we look back five years from now at this period, or even three years from now, we're going to kind of see how this all added up um, to what will probably be um, uh, a few different kinds of standards. You'll have some uh, vertical specific or uh, you know, uh, within certain disciplines, taxonomies uh, of, of credentials within certain trades and industries that groups have gotten together and worked on. So looking at it from how do we bring order to what these credentials mean across an industry, and then you'll have a, um, uh, a couple of uh, one or, 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 or two um, technical standards that have come together and coalesced around how does the information around these achievements, both in their unearned and their earned state, move across the ecosystem. Um, uh, there's work going on at the W3C uh, consortium. There's work going on uh, through Lumina-funded efforts like we talked about earlier. Um, uh, work going on with the IMS, uh, Global Learning uh, 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 Group, which is known for bringing tech standards. Uh, and so uh, each of these groups is building on the work that, that I think Open Badges has, has, you know, has, uh, uh, has provided the foundation for. So I'm not sure if that answered your question, Neil, but bottom line is um, it's moving, all moving, I think, in the, in the right direction. And let's tune into the same webinar three years from now and look back and and have a more concrete answer. Great. Uh, we just have a minute or two left, so um, let's see if Diane has any concluding comments she'd like to make, like maybe one or two takeaways for the audience, and then Jonathan. Absolutely. Thank you, Susan. We know I noticed when I have in the middle of one of my technical issues here that Stephanie has Stephanie out. So if Stephanie would like to re-ask the question, perhaps I can respond. Okay. Well, until, while she's doing that, um, my closing comments are this is exciting stuff, and, and we're really thrilled about, about how uh, badges connect um, uh, our, our students and our graduates to employers and the kind of evidence that they can uh, present to them, demonstrating what they know and what they know how to do. Um, this has been a great session, and I love the questions. What I really love is the challenge about about uh, the challenges you're offering us is really kind of great. There we go. Th thanks, Diane. Yes, uh, Susan, uh, yeah, uh, well, I, I'm really glad we had a chance to have this conversation. Um, there's obviously any conversation about badges is never just about badges. It's about meaning. It's about credentials. It's about connections between employers and the workplace. workplace. And if there's really any takeaway, it's that um, there are multiple stakeholders that come together when you think about what you want to put your institution's values on um, and what the grain size of, of uh, the achievements need to be. And, um, but, it, but if nothing else, it, is, it, it does open up discussions about how to innovate and change um, the way we deliver programming, the way we do assessment, and, and what, the, uh, uh, what the measure of, of success means. So, um, there are no, even though badges seem like a, a small little thing, like this stamp or this sticker, they open up some of the biggest questions in, in higher education today. So I'm glad to be part of those conversations with you all.
Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going to now toss it right back to Alex because I know he, we're at the end of our hour. Uh, to wrap up today's program, I want to thank our uh, panelists today, Susan, Jonathan, and Diane, on behalf of the NMC for taking time to help us learn a little bit more about digital badges and their, uh, how they're being used in higher education. I, I feel like we could have talked for another hour about this topic because it's, uh, there's lots of interesting things happening and, and the work that's, that's, that has developed over the years. And, and I, I, too, Jonathan, would like to tune in three years from now and see what, what the conversation is. Uh, in this area, but uh, we definitely know that it's happening, and it's happening quickly, so um, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Uh, participants, if you want more information about what you saw or heard today, uh, let us know by contacting me directly at alex at nmc.org. To learn more about future NMC Beyond the Horizon programs and get involved in our community, please visit our website at nmc.org, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter at nmc.org. Uh, please save the date for December 9th at 12 p.m. Central for our next NMC Beyond the Horizon where we will uh, show NMC members how to get the most from their NMC membership. So a very member-focused uh, program um, showing you uh, things beyond the Beyond the Horizon that we have uh, for you as members. And uh, we appreciate you tuning in. And with that, I'd like to uh, bid you a, a good afternoon or morning or evening wherever you are. Thank you.